I ran a Ponzi scheme. $57 million. Largest Ponzi scheme in South Carolina history. And I thought, he said it with pride. And one day, he brings it up again. Well, you know, uh, they indicted those guys. They're going to trial. And uh, you know, I just know that they're going to have me come up there and, you know, whatever, you know, testify. And they're not going to give me nothing, though. And I was like, I said, bro, why do you keep saying that? And he looked at me and he goes, can I trust you? And I said, probably not. And he said, I did hide some money. And I think they're going to find out about it. So I call my lawyer at the time and I said, hey, here's what I know. And I told him what I know, what he told me. And then they start asking me questions about Wilson. Like, uh, can you find out this? Can you find out this? So now I'm walking around the compound with this guy, probing him with questions. All this happened, right? And I'm emailing the Secret Service agent. I'm like, hey, what happened? And they're like, I, we, don't, we can't tell you what happened. But they did come in. And I promise you, it's basically he says it's going to be devastating to Wilson. So one day I'm, I'm out walking and I see Wilson. Hey, Cox, Cox. And I remember thinking, oh, shit. Hey, this is Matt Cox, and I appreciate you guys watching. I'm about to do another segment of the Frank Amadeo story. Now, if you've been watching the story, you understand how it's it's slowly progressing and that I'm currently, while I was right, while I, I met Frank in prison, I also wrote his a synopsis or a story about Frank while incarcerated. And I know Frank while incarcerated because he had done legal work for me. So several videos ago, I think maybe two, maybe three videos ago, Frank had represented me as my, you know, my prison lawyer on what's called the 2255, where he filed a reduction for me um, or on my behalf to the U.S., to the government. And the government, of course, they fought the reduction. Uh, I had done things. I'd been interviewed by Dateline and American Greed, and I'd also written an ethics and fraud course and a red flags rules course at the request of the government to reduce my sentence and the government, they wouldn't reduce it. Like they had asked me to do these things. They said they would consider it what's called substantial assistance. They said, we'll consider it substantial assistance. Subsistence, substantial assistance, typically, if they consider sub, something substantial assistance and they agree that it is substantial assistance, then they will reduce your sentence for that substantial assistance. Now, the government had said, but here's the problem. The problem is that the that the government said they would reduce my sentence and they didn't. And their reasoning behind it at that time was that there were no arrests made based on the assistance of Mr. Cox. And as a result of that, they didn't give me. They said, oh, well, nobody was arrested now, they knew going in nobody was going to be arrested. When you say, hey, we'll consider this substantial assistance if you're interviewed by Dateline. And then, like, there was no chance I was going to be interviewed by Dateline and they were going to go out and arrest people. Regardless, that's what they did to kind of trick me and my lawyer. Frank ended up filing a uh, 2255 and eventually got seven years knocked off my sentence. So, we're going to start at that point uh, for, the, for the sake of simplicity. I had gotten back to uh, to Coleman, and I'd been there maybe a month or two. Now, there, there'd been a guy on the compound. His name was uh, Ron Wilson. He was a con, an old con man. Uh, he was probably, I don't know what, what he was. Is he, in his six, he was in his 60s, 61, 62, maybe 63. I don't know exactly how old he was. But Ron Wilson had run a... Ponzi scheme in South Carolina. Ron Wilson's Ponzi scheme was based on trading uh, silver, right? So he he would trade he would trade silver in the um, is it commodities market, I think so. right? Yeah, you show. So I'm oh, sorry. 
So he would trade silver in the commodities market. And supposedly you really took possession like of the silver when this happened. So there's possession of the silver. He then trades it um, based on the fluctuation of, of, uh, of, of its value. What Ron Wilson was really doing was running a Ponzi scheme. Now, he would he he did these seminars uh, around really I think around the around basically throughout the South uh, you know Na- or Tennessee, North Carolina, Florida, Georgia, South Carolina of course, and he would go in and he'd do a seminar about how he trades and how he has a formula. And there were people that were, there are people that are, are financial advisors would come and he'd pitch financial advisors like, hey, get your clients to invest in this. And he'd pay them a certain amount of money. But what it really was, was a Ponzi scheme. And what a Ponzi scheme is, is that let's say you give me a thousand dollars and I'm going to tell you, hey, you give me a thousand dollars and I'm going to, I'm going to invest it for you. So you give me a thousand dollars and let's say a year from now, I say, I've made you one thousand dollars. I've made you $300, so 30%. So you now have $1,300 in the account. Well, let's say you turn around and you say, hey, Matt, I want my $1,300 back, but I haven't really invested. I haven't really done anything. I've actually spent your $1,000. But as long as I keep getting additional people to invest, so somebody else gives me a thousand and another guy gives me a thousand and another guy gives me a thousand. When the original investors start saying, Hey, I want to take my profits out. Like I want my $300. You can give him the $300 because you brought in $5,000 from other people. Even if that person says, I want my $300 profit and my original thousand dollar investment back, you can give that to them because you've given, or you've, you've collected $5,000 from five other people. Now, let's say three of those people want their money back. As long as you keep getting new investors to pay back the old investors, you can run a Ponzi scheme. The problem is at some point, most Ponzi schemes get to be so big and so many people are asking for their profits or their original capital back that it eventually collapses. And that's what happened with Ron Wilson's. Wilson had brought in, I want to say he brought in a a little over a hundred million dollars. He'd lost $57 million. So sometimes I would get an article and the article would say he, it's a $57 million Ponzi scheme. Sometimes it'd say Ron Wilson was running a hundred million dollar Ponzi scheme. Uh, bottom line is I know he owed about 57 million. So a lot of that money he had bought things with or just blown. This went on for 10, 15 years because the money that he was promising people wasn't too outrageous. Like, I don't think he was promising, you know, hundred percent returns. It, they were, it was a reasonable return. What well, really, it was still unreasonable. It's like 20, 30%, 40%, still unreasonable by the way. But, and, and most people that were investing with him, the bulk of his investors were made up of People that were using it as a retirement fund, pension funds, and churches. So there are churches that are investing their money with him. There are people that are paying into a pension fund for, let's say, a a steel manufacturer or some company that makes some kind of textile. And they've got 50 employees or 200 employees. They're giving Ron Wilson's company the money from the pension fund to invest. And because he'd been around so long, more and more people trusted him. Like you've been around 15 years. If it was a Ponzi scheme, it would have collapsed by now. So nobody thought it was a Ponzi scheme. Well, eventually what happened was in 2008, 2009, when things started going bad, uh, it caught up with him. People started asking for money back and he was paying out money, paying out money, paying out money. And he really felt like he could have weathered the storm. But some woman, he had taken some money from some woman, some woman's father, I I think, who was a retiree, he was like 70-something years old. He'd taken like 100,000, 200,000. She wanted her money back or his the money back. She said he was too old to know what he was doing. 
it, there was a huge argument, and then she ended up going to like the the FBI or something. Well, the FBI looked into it a little bit, made a few phone calls, and realized, hey, there's a this is potentially a Ponzi scheme. And so then they started um, filing subpoenas, and Wilson realized right away this is about to fall apart. Like this is going to fall apart. One of the things that they did was they called the depository um, where he was supposed to have been keeping his uh, his silver. So a lot of the silver is supposed to be dropped off at let's say you know like a, a a holding center. Well, when they called and asked for how much money of Ron Wilson's um, clients were there, there's almost nothing there. There should have been millions should have been like a hundred million dollars in silver there that he's trading. Nope. It's not there. So he's in trouble. He knows it. And Ron Wilson goes into the secret or goes in. He finds out the secret service is one investing it, investigating it. Ron Wilson goes into the secret service office and with his lawyer and says, look, I'm here. Uh, here's what happened. I'm running a Ponzi scheme. It's been 15 years. Here's how much money it is. I've, I've taken in, here's what I have, and here's what I have left. Wilson literally went and dug up uh, silver, gold, and th- these large cans of, uh, they were uh, ammunition cans. Like they, I guess the ammunition comes in like a tin, like these old tins that he had that had money in them, like just stacks of cash. Went and dug it up and gave it to the Secret Service. And said, this is what I did. Knew he was, he was doomed. He got 19 and a half years. Uh, you know, one of the, and you know, rightfully so. Uh, he was also, one of the problems was that Wilson was also, uh, he was like a city councilman or a county commissioner. Like, like he was held like really high up in the community. Like nobody saw this coming. Anyway, and, and then, of course, you've got people that basically have, like, they think that Wilson's got $3 million of their money, and it turns out there's no money. You'll be lucky to get $5,000 back when this is over. Like, there's nothing. So can you imagine, like, you think, like, you're retiring, like, you're, you're about to retire, or you've retired, and you're living off of Social Security, your house is paid back, and every once in a while you ask Wilson for $50,000 or 20000 and he's giving it to you, of course, but because you think you've got $3 million in the bank, but the truth is you got nothing. There's no money. So at that moment, you're not getting any more checks from him. Listen, there's something called a clawback clause uh, um, or a claw, clawing back money where typically what people don't realize is that when these government investigators come in, and they start looking at all the money. They start. They'll, they'll, one of the things they'll do is they'll say, "Okay, well, you invested a hundred thousand dollars into this Ponzi scheme, right? Right? But you took out four hundred thousand dollars in the last five years, right? Okay, so you made four hundred thousand that you should have made. Well, what are you talking about? I he said I had the money. He said he had been investing. Yeah, but he didn't. So the four hundred thousand dollars that you got out is money that other people gave him." So we're going to need that $400,000 back. Yeah, I wish you guys could see the look on Colby's face when I just said that. People don't realize that. that like in, in um, Bernie Madoff's case, there were some investors that had invested maybe a million dollars, but over the course of t- 10 years, they'd taken out you know, $10 million. The government went to them and said, you owe $9 million. And now, of course, uh, and literally, like they'll they'll come in, they'll say, "We're going to take your house. We're going to this. We're going to." Now, the problem is that most of the time, the government threatens you, and you get scared, and you like, "Oh, I'll give you this. I'll give you that." But the truth is, is a lot of times they just people negotiate. They go get an attorney. The attorney, like y- your primary residence, they can't really take. But let's say you've got four rental properties, they'll tell you, "Sell the rental properties and give us the money, or we'll just take them." Like there's a whole but they'll start taking your stuff. Now, so what happens is you get victimized twice, really. Once by the by the scammer, by the the uh, Ponzi schemer, and a second time by the U.S. government, when, or by the you know the government agency that comes in and tells you, by the way, all that money that you not only all the money that you thought you still had in there that's gone, but now the money you've been you got out over the last three years, we want all that back. 
a lot of times they'll negotiate like the five million down to a million dollars, like whatever they can give you back and you'll negotiate it. And usually that works. Anyway, so you have to understand that that Wilson had real victims. Uh, anyway, back to being in prison. Wilson shows up in prison and I remember he showed up. And one of the funny things was that white guys show up to prison and, you know, a lot of white guys, not a lot, I should say, some of the white guys that show up to prison, if you're an older white guy that has a certain look, and you know the look I'm talking about, they got the thick glasses, they're, they're kind of, oh, hi, how are you? they look like they've never left the house, they've been in the basement, pasty white. And, and so a lot of those guys come in and they, they, they were looking at like pictures of children or something. And they ended up getting five years. So they'll come in and they'll say, one of the things that they typically say, because they usually have no knowledge of drugs. Normally what they'll say when they get there is they'll say, oh, I'm, I'm, I'm here for fraud. Because they figure nobody really understands fraud unless you're another fraudster. And there's so many varying uh, cases of fraud or types of fraud, they figure they can get away with it. Well, the guys in the unit, when someone would show up and say fraud and they were like, I don't know, maybe he's here for fraud. Maybe he's here for looking at little kids' pictures. They would go, hey, Cox, go talk to that guy. See what he's here for. And I'd be like, oh, man. And usually I could, you could practically just look across the room and say, oh, yeah, that guy, is, he's, he's here for a sex offense. Like, he's, he's a weirdo. You can look at him and tell. But I remember I looked across at Wilson, and the way Wilson was standing and the look on his face the arrogance and confidence that he had being in his mid 60s glancing around the room with just disdain for everybody there i remember i looked at him and i went oh yeah no no he's he's here for fraud and they go what what makes you think that and i go that's a con man right there bro that's a straight con man and they go go talk to him and i went all right i walked up and i said hey man i heard you're here for fraud and he goes yeah I said, uh, what kind of fraud? And he said, <laughs> and he kind of looked at me. He goes, looked at me up and down. And he goes, I ran a Ponzi scheme, $57 million. Because he didn't say the $100 million. I think he might have said I took in $100 million. He goes, But I remember him saying the $57 million. He goes, $57 million. He said, largest Ponzi scheme in South Carolina history. And I thought, he said it with pride. Like he liked that he said he loved that title, and I remember thinking, I could, this guy's, I know what he's he's a con man, and I was like, really? And he goes, yeah. I said, well, what was the conveyance? And he goes, silver. And I said, really? So and he, I said, so what were you doing with the silver? Like trading it? He said, yeah, I was trading it. I people thought I was trading it on the, you know, as a commodity and whatever. So he went on and on about it. We started talking about. it. I was like, wow. Anyway, Wilson did not like a lot of people at that prison at, in prison. People did not like him in prison. Uh, He, you know, he was cooperating and he wasn't actively like telling people that he's cooperating, but people knew he was cooperating. Like it was kind of known. Uh, So he and I started hanging out and, you know, and I hate to say this, but I like, I liked Wilson. You know, he was super arrogant. He reminded me of my father. And so I started hanging out with him and, uh, you know, look, when I say arrogant, like arrogant people like arrogant people, but, and he, he was a storyteller. He would tell stories and we would walk around every once in a while and hang out and no big deal. And I remember we're walking around and, and I, I had just, you know, he, I had met him and then I went to prison. I went off, came back and he knew I got my sentence cut. Like everybody knew my sentence had been cut. They knew I had gone back to, to to court and got my sentence cut. So he, so he actively would tell me how he was, he was working with the secret service in South Carolina to help them indict several people that had been helping him. So he was actively cooperating. His fear was that they wouldn't reduce his sentence. And he kept saying to me like, yeah, they're, they're going to, they're going to fuck me out of my, my reduction sentence reduction. And I was always like, well, why do you say that? And so he he was like, ah, oh, they just are. They hate me. That that Secret Service agent, his name was, uh, I remember his last name was Griffin. 
He goes, ah, oh, that, that, uh, um, Griffin hates my gut. That agent Griffin, he hates my guts. And I was like, okay, well that doesn't really matter. Like he can hate your guts, but if, if you give them information that leads to an arrest, they have to reduce their sentence. And if they don't reduce it, I was like, fuck, we'll have Frank file a 2255. Like he'll get a, re we'll get you the reduction. Because if you, if you provide information that leads to an arrest, like there's almost a guarantee, well, not guaranteed, but there's probably a 90% chance they're going to reduce your sentence. And, and so he just kind of would shrug it off. Right. He was always like, ah, and I was like, why do you think, I remember one time I, I said, why do you think that they're not going to reduce your sentence? And he said, yeah, they think I've hidden Ponzi scheme money. Like I told them I turned over all the money. He actually dug up like six or $7 million worth of silver and cash and brought it into the South Carolina and gave it to him. And I was like, are you serious? And he goes, yeah, I gave them the, but they think there's still money out there. And I was like, well, why would you give them, you know, so why would you provide, give them $7 million? Like, why wouldn't you just say, look, I'm coming in, turn myself in because the money's gone. Like if you've already laundered that much money, why would you then turn it in? Why would you just say, bro, I'm only, I'm turning myself in because the money's gone. Like I've literally got maybe $150,000 and I got some money in my checking account and my, some savings. Like I, I don't have anything. That's why I'm turning myself in. But he didn't. He came in and said, look, this whole thing's unraveling. I know you're about to figure it all out and you're going to arrest me. So I'm coming in. And by the way, here's what I have left. Like that to me was just stupid. But it also made sense that maybe, you know, that maybe he had given them all the money. So anyway, he was insisting that they didn't believe him. And I was like, okay, well, you did give them all the money. So don't worry about it. It's it's going to, it'll work out. Plus, of course, he, he was going to go back. He was going to go back to uh, court and have to testify at trial. So you're going to go back to court and testify. Like, it's, it's very difficult for them to not give you a reduction. If you provided them information, people were indicted, they then go to trial, and these good people were going to trial, and then you go and testify. So you testify, and then the government's, then for the government to then turn around and say, Ah, oh, we're not going to reduce your sentence. Like that's not, that's not even possible. Like there's no court that would uphold that. Like what's your reason for not giving me a reduction? You have to have a reason, a good valid reason. Anyway, the point is he insisted about uh, on this. So we're walking around and we're walking around. And one day he brings it up again. Well, uh, you know, uh, they indicted those guys. They're going to trial. And, uh, you know, I just know that they're going to have me come up there and, you know, whatever, you know, testify. And they're not going to give me nothing, though. And I was like, I said, bro, why do you keep saying that? Like, I said, I mean, uh, you know, what do you, what do you, and I said, why do you keep saying that? And he, and he looked at me and he goes, can I trust you? And I said, probably not. And he, and he kind of chuckled. <laughs> and he said, I did hide some money and I think they're going to find out about it. And I went, really? Why do you, what do you mean? I thought you gave him all the money. And he's like, oh, I, 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 I gave him a lot of the money, but I, I did give a little bit of money to my brother and my, his soon to be ex-wife. He gave like $150,000. I think he told me, he said, I don't remember what it was. 130, 150. I forget. I don't know what she took or what I gave her. He said, uh, uh, and my brother's got a little bit of money, maybe twenty, thirty thousand dollars $30,000, like not a lot. I was like, oh, okay. I said, well, look, they're not going to find out about that. So don't worry about it. And he goes, no, you don't understand. Like his wife who was divorced, they were getting a divorce. His wife had found out that he was having an affair with a, one of the financial examiners, I'm sorry, advisors. He was working with a woman who was a financial advisor and he was having an affair with her. His wife, during this whole process, when this whole thing fell apart and he gets indicted and he's thrown in jail and everything, she finds out that he's having this affair. I think she found out during the course of this, this thing. And, and then so, but she was, she was furious about it. I mean, she's not talking to him. He's not talking to her. He wants to get a divorce. She wants to get a divorce. And in the process, he's, he was, his fear was he's thinking he's going to get five or 10 years knocked off of his sentence, but he knows that if his wife 
could screw him out of it, she would. So he's like, she's gonna, she's gonna. I'm, my fear is she's gonna turn in the money and say he gave this to me, and that's going to ruin my chance to get a sentence reduction. And I was like, okay, well, she's not gonna do that because they've already asked her if you have any money, and she said no. He never gave me anything. She'd already told him this. I said, so she would be admitting to obstruction of justice. She's not gonna do that. And he was like, ah, I don't know. And so we're whatever. We're walking around. And I remember thinking when he told me this, my, one of my first thoughts, probably my first thought was, is that enough to get me a reduction? Like him telling me that. If I were to tell the Secret Service or the, the government, if I were to tell them, would they give me a reduction for saying, hey, you think that he's got Ponzi scheme money? He really does. And then if they find the money, um, would they give me a reduction? Uh, I remember thinking, they're not going to reduce my sentence for that. Like, they didn't want to reduce my sentence the first time. They all, And I got seven years off the first time. So they already think I got seven years that I don't deserve. So they're certainly not going to give me a re sentence reduction for Ron Wilson. And I thought, they're never going to reindict him for this. Let's say I were to, I mean, immediately I started thinking if I said something and they went to his wife, his wife's going to deny it. I don't have any money. That's it. It's over. If they go to his brother. His brother's going to be like, I don't have any money. That's it. Like there's not much they can do to prove this. What's going on YouTube? RDAP Dan here, Federal Prison Time Consulting. Hope you guys are all having a great day. If you're seeing and hearing this right now, that means you're watching Matt Cox on Inside True Crime. At the end of Matt's video, there will be a link in the description where you can book a free consultation with yours truly, RDAP Dan, where we can discuss things that could potentially mitigate your circumstances to receive the best possible outcome at sentencing or even after you've started your prison sentence. Prior to sentencing, we can focus on things like your personal narrative, your character reference letters, prepping you properly for the pre-sentence interview, which is going to determine a lot of what type of sentence you receive. If you've already been sentenced, we can also focus on the residential drug abuse program how you can knock off one year off of your sentence. Also, we have the First Step Act where you can earn FSA credits while serving your sentence. For every 30 days that you program through the FSA, you can actually knock an additional 15 days off per month. These are huge benefits, and the only way you're going to find out more is by clicking on the link and booking your free consultation today. All right, guys, see you soon at the end of the video. Peace. I'm out of here. Back to you, Matt. They would then have to show his wife and his brother, Wilson, told us about this. And even then, even then I think that they most likely would still say, I don't know what you're talking about because they, they'd been be admitting to some type of a crime. Like you, you'd have to find the money. How are we going to find the money? Like they don't even know. I mean, $30,000. Like I, I just remember thinking one, they're not going to indict these people Two, They're not going to indict Wilson because he's already got 19 and a half years. He's going to die in prison. He's like 64, 63, I forget how old he was, but he just started his sentence. Like he's not getting out. They're not going to give him more. What are they going to, how much more time are they going to give him? He's never going to make it. Anyway. So I remember when he said that it kind of went through my mind and I thought, eh, no reason to say something like there's, there's no reason for me to say anything. And so I went to bed that night thought about it a little bit and that, eh, it's nothing. A week went by, two weeks went by, three weeks went by, four weeks went by. So about a month later afterward, I had been waiting for my lawyer to send me my transcripts because I'd written a memoir, but I hadn't published the memoir. I, I had a, a manuscript. And I wanted to add, because you got to think my memoir ends with me getting 26 years and going to prison. Like, that's it. So I thought, hey, I want to add a chapter about me getting seven years knocked off my sentence. So I want, but I wanted to include some of the transcripts, you know, some of the, some of the stuff that was said. And I, so I wanted to get the, be able to use the transcript. So I, and my lawyer said she'd send them to me. Well, it'd been, at this point, it'd be been two, three months, Right. A month, but it also only been a month since I talked to Wilson. So I call my lawyer at the time and I said, Hey, listen, 
did you ever get the transcription? She goes, oh, Matt, I'm so sorry. I was going to get those. I'll get them. And I'm sorry. And she, uh, I'll take care of it. And I, okay, okay, cool. And I remember I was about to hang up the phone. And she goes, so what's going on? I go, what do you mean? She said, anything happening in there? And I remember thinking, that's weird. It's weird that she would say that. Like, she never wanted to talk to me before. She certainly, she's not even my lawyer anymore. Like, what do you want to talk to me now for? When the case was happening, you didn't want to talk to me. So I, I went, um, no, nothing's happening. She goes, are you sure? She goes, nothing, nothing going on. I went, no. I said, you know what? Something did happen the other day. Listen to this. And I tell her about Wilson. And she goes, hold on a second. And she looks him up on the computer and she comes back. She goes, oh, wow. This is a bad guy. And I just remember thinking, because, you know, I, didn't, I knew what he'd done, but I, I didn't think of him as a bad guy. He was gruff, you know. Uh, he was abrasive. My mom would have described him as abrasive. She always described my dad as being a, having an abrasive personality. So he was abrasive, but I didn't think he was like a bad person. Of course, he didn't steal any money from me. So no big deal. I sat there. I was like, okay. And she goes, oh, wow. She goes, you know what? Let me make some phone calls. And I was kind of like, all right. I mean, yeah, but I don't think they're going to do anything for me. And she goes, well, let me make some calls. I said, all right. I don't think anything else about it. A week later, one of the correctional officers comes up to me and he says, hey, Cox. And I go, yeah, what's up? He goes, you got to go to SIS. SIS is like their internal security for the prison. I went, okay. He said, next move. So they have controlled moves where they open the doors and let you go to someplace else and then they lock them again. So they give you like 10 minutes to get somewhere. So I was like, uh, okay. And he said, all right. And so 10 minutes later, 20 minutes later, the doors open. I go to SIS. I knock on the door. They open it. They go, come in here. And I said, okay, what's up? And they go, sit down. The lieutenant asked me to sit down. This guy was such a prick. Uh, he goes, sit down. I walk in. I'm like, yeah, what's up? And I'm thinking, oh, fuck, I'm in trouble. What did I do? And he goes, hold on a second. He picks up the phone and starts calling. And I remember just thinking he's making a phone call. And he's like, right? Yeah, I got him right here. Okay, here, hold on. Boom, he goes, you got to talk to this guy. And I go, hello? And the guy says, it's a secret service agent. He goes, this is secret service agent, uh, uh, Griffin, is this Scott Griffin. I forget his name. First name. Uh, this is secret service agent Griffin. And I was like, Whoa, I was like, Hey, what's going on? He said, I understand, you know, where, uh, Ron Wilson has, uh, hidden money, Ponzi scheme money. And I went, um, I do. I said, it's not a lot of money. He goes, well, how much He goes, well, where is it? And I went, whoa, whoa, whoa wait a second, bro. I said, the government's already tried to fuck me out of one reduction. So I said, I I'm going to need something in writing. So he goes, uh, okay. He said, listen, he goes, uh, take my, take my email address down. So I write down his email address and he says, put me on your core links and I'll get back with you. I'll, I'll, I'll get you something in writing. I go, okay. So anyway, this takes another week or two for him to get something in writing. And basically what he gets in writing is it says, it says that the, the U.S. attorney agrees that if I provide them information that leads to, to the uh, either the indictment or to an indictment or the um, recovery of a substantial amount of money, they will consider it substantial assistance. Now, they're not going to promise you anything. They said they, they'll consider it substantial assistance and reduce my sentence. It was the best I was going to get. So I, I, anyway, I end up emailing him back and I go, okay, that's cool. And I remember I printed that thing off like five times, stuck it in like four different places. So nobody, I would never lose it. So, uh, so this is a letter from the secret service, which has copied me on a letter from the U S attorney's office. Like that's as good as you're going to get. Anyway, what ends up happening is they say, look, we, we, you know, we want to know what's going on. I said, okay, here's what I know. And I told them what I know, what he told me, this is what he told me. I said, but it's not millions of dollars. It's like 150, it's under $200,000. Like it's like 180,000 at most, maybe 150. And the, I said, most likely these people are going to just deny they have it. So I don't know what to tell you. And they were like, well, uh, we have some questions. And then they start asking me questions about Wilson. Like, 
Uh, can you find out this? Can you find out this? So now I'm walking around the compound with this guy, probing him for question, with questions. Now, it's not hard because he's a talker. He likes to talk, tell stories. And I would just ask him about this or ask him about that and then w- sit back and wait. Sometimes you sit back and wait and you walk around the track for 45 minutes or an hour and he never broaches the subject. He never gets to what I wanted to know. Sometimes I'd say, hey, whatever happened with you told me about this person so-and-so? Like, what happened? Did they get arrested? Did he go, no, nah, I told you they didn't get arrested. Look, all, all that guy ever did was, and then he'd tell me everything he did. And then I'd go back and say, this is what he said he did. Like, that doesn't sound like, you know, you guys are asking this and this, this is what he's telling me. And then they would come back and say, do you feel like he's lying to you? And I'd say, no, I don't think he's lying to me. Like he's, um, he's already here. He's locked up. He knows that this government doesn't want to give me anything. So there's no benefit for me to cooperate. He doesn't believe so. I didn't even believe there was a benefit to cooperate. Like, I don't think they're going to indict this guy. He's going to die in prison. And I don't think that his wife has given up any, inf- any, any money or his brother. Plus they don't have any money. Like, you understand it was the, the, the letter was written in a way that easily allowed the government to say, well, yeah, we collected $200,000, but. We don't consider that substantial. We don't consider that a substantial amount of money. And we're not going to indict anyone. So those two things right there, like either one, I don't get a reduction. Anyway, so I walk around with him. This goes on for, I swear, three to six months. Back and forth, back and forth. Well, they eventually call in Wilson's wife. She goes in and they ask her, do you have any money? We have reason to believe that he gave you money. She says, no, he never gave me any money. I don't know what you're talking about. I would give you the money. Okay, she leaves. The next day, the wife shows up. Now, keep in mind, the brother, they call the brother and ask the brother to come in. He's supposed to show up at, let's say, 4 o'clock with his lawyer. Like at, let's say, 10 o'clock in the morning, The wife shows up, walks in with a big ammunition can. Remember the the ammunition tins that he had had buried, walks in with one, puts it on the table. It's got 150, no, wait. It has like 300,000 in cash plus a bunch of silver and gold bullions. Is that wrong? Was it? The combination, no, no. Yeah, it was like 300, it was 350, 350,000 in cash and bullion. So I don't know if the cash was maybe 200,000 in cash plus a bunch of gold bullion. So she brings in about 350,000. Later that day, the his brother comes in. He walks in with 150,000 in cash and boom, throws it on the table. Wanted to let you know this is what he gave. He gave me this money, and I've been the guilt's been eating me alive. And so he, before they even ask him, he just knows it's coming. So he just brings it with his lawyer. Well, um, w- uh, they end up. I remember. <laughs> let me get, so I remember. Well, this I, I, all this happened, right? And I'm emailing the Secret Service agent. I'm like, "Hey, what happened?" And they're like, I, "We don't. We can't tell you what happened." But they did come in, and I promise you, it's basically, he says, it's going to be devastating to Wilson. And I was like, oh, wow. They must have shown up with the 150, 200,000 in cash. I didn't know it was half a million dollars. So what happens is I'm walking around. So one day I'm, I'm out walking, and I see Wilson. Hey, Cox, Cox. And I remember thinking, oh, shit. This old man's gonna, he, like he might he I hope my name didn't come up. We, so he had talked to his lawyer. I knew he was trying to call his lawyer. He'd gotten an email from his lawyer saying, "Call me tomorrow" or something. And he'd called him several times, but he wasn't picking up. So one day he's like, "Cox, Cox," and I look over. I'm like, "Oh fuck! What? I hope this old man's not gonna come up to me. You motherfucker! You know something? Like I don't know what's gonna happen." And so he walk, comes, walks up. He, ah, and I go, I go, yeah. What's up? What's up? And he go, he said, you're not gonna believe this. He said, my wife is ex, soon to be ex wife. He goes, my wife walked in. She turned in three hundred fifty thousand dollars, and she and my brother came and gave him the one fifty. And I go, one fifty? 
thought you said he had twenty or thirty thousand. And he goes, I know. I didn't think I could trust you. I, 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 I. So I didn't tell you how much it was. And I was like, Oh, okay. Your wife had how much? I go, man, that's half a million dollars, bro. And he was like, I know, I know. He said, they're, they're going to they're gonna indict me. They're going to indict me. I said, ah, they're not going to indict you. It's probably just they gave him the money back. Probably nothing will happen. He said, I, I don't know, I don't know. Listen, probably a few weeks go by. And he calls his lawyer. His lawyer says, boom, they indicted you. They indicted him and they indicted the, the wife and the brother. And so maybe a week later, he's on the pack out list to, to be moved. And I remember he came to me and he said, they indicted me. I went, no. Now keep in mind, I'd already heard this from the secret service. Secret service had already told me, Hey, we indicted him and his wife and his brother. So he comes to me one day and it's funny too, because it wasn't like the same day. Like it was a few days later, he comes to me. So I know that I'm walking around for two days. Like, when's this motherfucker going to come talk to me about this? I'd see him. I'd say, Hey man, how's it going? He'd be like, Oh, it's, it's fine. How's it going? How's it going? Like, yeah. Comes to me one day, he goes, talks. And I go, yeah, what's up? He goes, you're not going to believe this. I said, what? He said, they indicted me. I went, oh my, are you serious? Man, I really didn't think they were going to indict you. And he's like, yeah. And they indicted my wife and my brother. And I was like, fuck. He was like, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm done. I'm done. I was like, fuck. And so we're walking around. And he goes, what do you think I should do? And I go, you should go to trial. Because I thought if he went to trial, they'd call me to testify at his trial. And then they'd have to give me a reduction. So I'm like, <laughs> how horrible is that, right? Like, I'm like, because think about it. If you go to trial, there's no way they're not going to give you a reduction. So I'm like, yeah, you need to go to trial, bro. You need to go to trial. Fuck these guys. Don't you take any shit. You make them spend some money on you. I mean, what do you care? And he's like, yeah, yeah, I don't know. I think maybe I should just go in and just plead guilty and just take whatever they get, throw myself on the mercy of the, on the court. And I'm like, man, fuck those motherfuckers. They gave you 19 and a half years. He's like, I, I, I don't know. I don't know. Wait. So yeah, whatever. A couple days later, a week later, I forget, maybe a few days later, he ends up on the pot on what's called the, the pack out list, which is your trend. Like it's like pack out your stuff, you know, and show up at R and D, which basically means you're, it's a transfer list. Like you're going to be, you're moving. They're bringing you back to court. So he packs his stuff up, they grab him, and they move him to South Carolina. And I remember before he was leaving, he was like, I don't know how long I'll be there, but I'll see you when I, when I get back. And I was, remember thinking, you're, you're never coming back here. Like, he can't. Like, because I knew when he got back to court, he would get his discovery, which is all of the documents in your case. Like, this is what we have against you. And I knew he was going to see that I was a person that, gave them the information to indict him. So when he's leaving, he's like, well, hey, I'll, I'll be back in a few months, the three, six months. I'll be back. I'll, I'll see you when I get back. And I was like, yeah, yeah, of course, of course. But I'm thinking, yeah, I'm never seeing you again, bro. Like you're, you're not coming back from South Carolina, not here because I'm here. They're going to put a, what's called a, a, a management variable on you. It's like a, a separation agreement. Like these two guys cannot be at the same prison. So he gets moved. He gets, he's obviously been reindicted. He gets sentenced. Once he's sentenced, he gets sentenced and I'm waiting. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm waiting. This funny thing is by this point, there's actually a no newspaper article that says that Wilson had confessed to hiding Ponzi scheme money to an, a fellow inmate. Now, they didn't mention my name, but that article starts going around. The other thing other, around the compound, so people are like, God, can you believe that? I'm like, that's fucked up. Who would do that? That's just wrong. Anyway, the other thing Wilson did was he got the discovery and realized it was me, of course, you know, um, and sent a letter back to his old celly who was a guy that we called, um, I think they called him uh, Randy Savage because he had a big, he had white hair. He looked like Randy Savage. Anyway, which is a rest, an old an old school wrestler. So uh, I forget, I think that's the name they called him. So 
I, I remember people started coming up to me. Some guy came up to me and said, yo, bro. And I was like, what's up? They said, what's up with Wilson? I was like, what do you mean? He got indicted. They're like, yeah, but you know, he wrote a letter back to his old celly. He said that you fucking cooperated against him. I was like, are you serious? I was like, boy, that's fucked up. And they're like, is it true? And I'm like, of course it's not true. And they would just look at me, but you know that I'm sitting there like, no, nah, it's not true. Like, you know, go fuck yourself. Like, we're not having this conversation. Because you're just, these guys are all gossipers. They just want to get some information and then take off and go tell everybody. Like, you know, hey, bro, you can trust me. Stop with that shit. So, I'm, this, this happened like maybe two people have said something to me. But keep in mind, too, there's only a small group of guys. Like, you click up, so you have a small click. Anyway, I remember being at commissary one day. And now a, a guy comes up to me and tells me, hey, Cox. And I said, yeah, what's up? And he goes, his name was Marty. Marty comes up, he goes, Cox, he goes, listen. First of all, I'd like to let you know, I don't give a shit. I don't care what you did. I'm just curious. And he goes, Wilson, I know Wilson was cooperating against his co-defendants. Wilson would have cut your throat. I don't care. Fuck him. He said, but... He wrote a letter back to his old Sally that says that you cooperated against him. I'm just curious if you did it. And I went, oh, what are you talking about? That's crazy. So I was like, no. I was like, where is his old Sally? Anyway. So, and you know, and he's like, oh, he's over there, whatever. So I end up going to his old Sally and I walk up to him and I go, hey, what's going on? Uh, you know, Rick or whatever his name was, they called him. And, he, and he's like, yeah, what's up? He goes, oh, hey, Matt, what's going on? Like, it was real, oh, hey, 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 Matt, what's going on? I said, oh, how's it going? He goes, oh, it's going good, it's going good. Now, keep in mind, this guy's wife had moved, like, across the, the, the country to and bought a house, like, next to the prison so she could keep visiting him. And he's, like, in his 60s. And he's getting out in, like, he's still got, like, four or five years, something like that. So I walk up to him. I said, oh, how's it going? How's it going? He's, oh, it's going good, it's going good. I said, oh, okay. I said, listen, bro. I said, if one more person comes up and tells me that you've been showing this letter that Wilson mailed back, mailed to you, I said, I'm going to go in to the lieutenant's office and I'm going to explain that you're showing this fucking letter trying to get me fucked up. I guess you're trying to get me stabbed or beat up or something. I don't know. And the look on his face was like, holy shit. And I said, here's what I do know is that they're not going to transfer me from this prison. Because I have, a, I have a, a management variable on me. I can't be transferred. Now, that's not true. But I know he already thinks the worst of me. I, and I told him, I said, I'm actively working with the FBI on a case. I said, you know I worked on the case with, on, on Wilson. So they're not transferring me from this facility. I said, so when I go and I tell them that you've got this letter and you're showing people, I said, they're going to fucking transfer you to FDIC Baghdad. I said, and I know you're never going to see your fucking wife again. I said, one more fucking person. And he looked at me. I said, are we good? He's like, we're good. Nobody else is going to see that letter. We're good. We're good. I said, okay. And I turned around and walked off. So with that said, Wilson was indicted. He was resentenced. And he was, when he was resentenced, he was sentenced to six more months of prison. So his 19 and a half year sentence went to 20. Six months. His wife and brother ended up getting community service. I think his wife, because she had lied to the FBI. They were both charged with, um, with uh, obstruction of justice. I think his wife got like a year. I think his brother got like 50 hours of community service or 100 hours of community service. And that was it. Like nothing. Like they're not even felons. And I remember thinking, fuck. Like they're not even going to, like I'm not getting a reduction because nobody got any more prison time, really, except for Wilson. And I was like, damn. And I was right because what happened was three months went by, nothing. Four months went by, nothing. My lawyer is calling the U.S. attorney. They're not answering her calls. 
So I go to Frank and I explain this whole thing to Frank. I said, Frank, bro, this is what happened. And keep in mind, Frank knew the whole time I was cooperating. And Frank was like, document this, print the email out, print this out, document this, write down a log, tell him what you said, tell him this, tell him that, do this, do that. And I was like, okay, okay, okay. So I'm doing everything Frank says to document everything. Frank's like, do you have all the documents? And I go, yeah, I got everything. He said, okay, we're going to file a 2255. He said, we're going to, I'll get you, he goes, we'll get you the time off. I was like, okay. Frank files a 2255. It goes up to the, goes up to the court. Says, hey, I re- did this. I did this. I did this. I've been working with the government. The government promised me this. They promised me that. And the government comes back and says, that's absolutely untrue. We don't even know what Mr. Cox is talking about. We will look into it. But you're on at this point, Mr. Cox is time barred. And as I mentioned in the other video, you only have one year from being sentenced from your original sentence, you have one year to file a 2255 or you're what's called time barred, which means you can't file anything else. Your sentence is permanent. Now there are ways to get around it. And Frank's way of getting around it was saying that the government asked me to do something that helped to reduce my sentence. And as a result of that, it reset the time bar. So, Now, that typically doesn't work, but it had also been a year since I had been resentenced. So he also used that. Hey, this guy was resentenced, so the time bar was reset. Second thing was he was approached by the government and asked to cooperate and told he would be getting a reduction. Anyway, the government came back and said, we don't know anything about this, and that doesn't matter anyway. He's time barred. So they're now denying that they've had any kind of agreement with me. So what we do is we, of course, file the letter. We file a, a rebuttal to their to their motion and or to their reply. We file a rebuttal and I no no and and we explain the whole thing. And then I end up sending we end up sending that. I want to say we and I could be wrong. I think we either included it in the motion or we sent it to the judge. The judge turned around and the judge came back and said, I'm denying your motion, but I'm he, there's something called that you have to get a, certif- a certificate of eligibility, meaning you're certified to appeal your the, the judge's decision. Judges hate that. Like if a judge says this is the way it is, and then you appeal it, that your your appeal your judge is pissed. Like you should have just accepted my decision. So that you have to get a a, a, ju- a um you have to get this um this certificate of appealability by another judge by like a magistrate judge has to say yeah he can he can appeal this well and, and by the way there's like a five hundred dollar fee which I don't have so my judge says he says I'm denying it because he said I don't have the right to make this decision like I don't have jurisdiction. He goes, but I'm going to waive the $500 fee and I'm waiving the requirement of getting a certificate of eligibility. And I'm fast, basically fast tracking this to the appellate court and have asking them to make the decision. Now, here's the thing. There's subtleties in the law and the way judges do things. That was all but saying to the prosecution, I believe this man, that Mr. this inmate or defendant, deserves to get a reduction, but I don't have the authority to do it. Now you have to go to the, I have to go to the, that, the, my judge anyway, to be denied, to go to the appellate court. And I felt he did have jurisdiction. But if he agrees, you're right, I don't have jurisdiction because that was part of the government's argument. You don't have jurisdiction. This is this that it it's very clear in the district, the federal district that I'm in, it's very clear that the that a a judge doesn't have the right to reduce your sentence, that only the government can file a motion. The judge can't really force them to do it. Now, it's questionable. But the government said it's it's clear. And the judge obviously didn't want to make that decision and have to go through that whole thing. So what he did was he said, I'm going to let the appellate court make the decision. But by waiving the $500, waiving the certificate of eligibility, he was saying, if I could, 
make this decision. I bl- I would like one. I think I, I I would like to, but I can't. And two, I think he deserves something. He's already saying I think he deserves something because he's saying let the appellate court say it. I can't say it, but let the appellate court say it. And he's fast tracking me to get that answer. So that's all but saying to the government, I believe this guy's right. So the government comes in immediately and says and files a files a sentence reduction. They file what's called a a, a rule thirty five. Immediately they file rule 35. And I remember we got it on like, like a Wednesday or something. So we get it on a Wednesday. They filed it on a Monday. We get it on Wednesday. So what they said to the judge is we're filing a one level reduction. And that one level reduction would have reduced my sentence by something like, I don't know the exact amount, but I think it was like 15 months. So it would have been like, a little over a year. Maybe it was 14 months. Like it was barely a year off my sentence. And I brought it to Frank and I was like, fuck, they filed it. Because our whole argument was we're making you file it, but we can't make them re- give us a, redu- a, a a certain reduction. We can argue, but not if it's already ruled on. If the judge already rules on it, then it's too late for me to argue I need more. So... um. It, it, what happens is is I go and I bring it to Frank and I go, fuck, they already, they already filed it. And Frank goes, all right, hold on a second. Uh, get, get John, get Jimmy and Tom. And like he immediately starts barking orders like a little general. And so it, these guys show up and he sits there on a piece of paper and starts and scribbles out a motion. It scribbles out like a, 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 a one page motion asking the court to not rule on the sentence reduction. That I'm at, that I'm asking for the my right. My right is to provide evidence of what the reduction should be. But after the fact, I can't do anything. So he he asked for the court to immediately cease all all activity. I forget what they call it, and ask the court to order an evidentiary hearing so that I can provide evidence in front of the court. So that they can make an informed decision on how much of a reduction I should get. So we send that motion in. They get it by Friday. So the judge hasn't ruled. I remember being terrified the judge had already ruled. I felt like the judge was going to get it and sign off on it. Like my judge typically, it's he's efficient, unfortunately. He he doesn't wait. Things don't sit on his desk for two years. Like this guy gets a motion, they read it, and they, they make a decision within days. Well, what happens is they get it on Friday. So they put the motion in on Monday. They get our response on Friday. And the judge immediately says, I'm ceasing all all activity. And I'm asking for the, I'm appointing an, an attorney. So he gave me an attorney and ceases all activity, including my appeal. By the way, at this point, I've appealed. I'm filing an appeal. Um. So the government gives me a lawyer. The lawyer, which was in in Atlanta, I was in in just outside of, I was in Coleman, which is a a mile north of uh, Tampa. She gets on a plane. She flies down to, to, uh, she flies down to Coleman. She comes and meets me. Her name was Leanne uh, something. Anyway, so I meet with Leanne. And I remember I go into Leanne and I said, you know, I'm, I talked to her and it was almost a, a, a replay of the exact conversation I had had with Esther Panich, which was my, my other lawyer. She came, she sat down in the attorney client visitation room. We sit down. She says, listen, I read your motion. She said it was very well written. She goes, I don't think legally it's appealable and I don't think that you're going to win it. So I think you should take the government's, the one point the government is offering. And I said, well, I don't want the one point. I want to provide evidence that I deserve four points off. No, I said five points. I deserve uh, levels. I go, I deserve five levels off. And she said, they're never going to give you five levels off. I said, well, I want five. And I, and she said, I said, I'll take like I remember said, I go, Frank said to tell you that I will take 
four levels, but we need to argue for five. And she goes, who's Frank? And I go, Frank's the guy that wrote all my, my motions for me. She goes, you didn't do this? I said, no, no, I didn't write any of this. I said, Frank wrote all these motions. And she goes, okay, who's Frank? And I go, well, Frank's a disbarred attorney who's mentally um, incompetent. Like the state of Florida has legally cl- deemed him mentally incompetent. And he's locked up here. I said, he's a rapid cycling bipolar with features of schizophrenia that is here because he embezzled like $200 million from the federal government. And she sat there and she goes, he embe- he embe- and embezzled that much money. I went, yeah. I said he he. I said, but he had a reason. She goes, what's that? I said, well, he's planning on taking over the world. He was using the money to take over the world. And she goes, are you serious? I said, I'm absolutely serious. I, she goes, she goes, that's that's crazy. I said, he's absolutely insane. I said, but he got me this far. And she went, you don't have a chance if you go forward. You don't have a chance of winning. And I went, really? And she goes, yeah. I said, then why are you here? And she goes, what do you mean? I said, well, why why are you here? I said, if the government could so easily crush me, why haven't they crushed me? You're here because the government is negotiating with me. They've already filed the reduction. We're now just arguing over how much of a reduction. So I've already won. It's to the degree that I've won that is now up for discussion. They wouldn't have given me the one level if they could have won so easily. And she was like, okay, and you're taking the advice of a guy who is, she said, crazy. And I went, yeah, absolutely. I said, but all the lawyers on the street that I spoke with, told me I couldn't get this far. I go, this is the second reduction that this guy's won. Let me tell you the odds, and I know I said it in the other video, but it's it's worth saying again. For every 3,500 2255s that are filed by inmates, one receives a reduction. One receives no, not not like a sentence, but they, they call it movement or, uh, it, you know, that something happens. 3,500 of these are filed that are denied, denied. They get no, they get nothing at all. And that one doesn't necessarily get a sentence reduced. That one 3,500, uh, they may get some kind of a ru- reduction in their sentence. They may simply, maybe they get 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 um let out of prison or maybe they simply get their case heard and their their sentence is simply reinstated they get nothing but they would say that that's that's movement like i got something i got movement in the court there was a something happened may not have been your, the result you wanted that's 3500 so my chances of getting a sentence reduction on my first one was 3500 my sentence, my chances of getting a reduction on my second one is 3,500. This guy's now gotten me two reductions. Now we're just arguing over how much. So I tell her, look, Frank said I will not accept less than four levels, but let's ask for five. She just shakes her head. She's like, this is, that's insane. She's like, but okay. She goes back to Atlanta, goes back to Atlanta, files a motion. Saying, or no, I'm sorry. She she just goes and she meets with the U.S. attorney. U.S. attorney says, absolutely not. She says, um, we'll give him two levels off. That's it. That's the most he's going to get is two levels off. And I said, she calls me. So I, she tells me to call her. I got, she said, look, the most you're going to do is two levels off. She goes, Matt, that's 23. It was like, I forget what that was. It was like 28, 28. It's like 28 months off. Was like, that's 28 months off. Like you should be happy. Like I'm like, happy? Twenty? Um, no, absolutely not. Listen, I'm so scared at this point. My heart's racing. Like I'm terrified. I'm ready to take anything at this point. I'm terrified. And this is this has now been like a year and change that we've been going back and forth. We argue. We go back forth, back forth. And I keep asking for the the letter, the sent. The, so keep in mind, the Secret Service filed what's called a that they requested. They requested the U.S. Attorney reduce my sentence. And I kept asking for a copy of the request for that letter. 
I even filed a, a Freedom of Information Act requesting that letter. The government kept saying that, like, first they, they basically were saying we don't have it. There was no request. But I know there was a request because I know the Secret Service told me they made the request. So I know they're lying. And listen, so anybody, anybody that thinks, oh, the government wouldn't lie, you're fucking insane. These people lie all the time, especially to inmates. And also they lie to the court. They lie to the court all the time, which is ridiculous because you should have to go to prison. If a defense attorney lies to the court, they can get disbarred and go to the prison. If you work for the government and you lie to the, to the courts, they don't do nothing to you. Nothing. Those people regularly lie. And so they lied and said, we don't even have, we don't have, we don't know what you're talking about. So I filed for the Freedom of Information Act. So we're going back and forth, back and forth. Finally, finally. When they realized that they were going to give me the Freedom of Information Act, people were going to give me the reduction. The government comes forward and says, fine, here's what it is. Here's what they filed. And they give it to us. Shows 500,000. Listen, the Secret Service agent, Agent Griffin, I was almost embarrassed at the glowing recommendation that he gave me for a sentence reduction. Like, I provided a massive amount of information. I helped clean up this and clear up this and move the forward the, the whole case forward and that they had nothing on this guy prior to talking to me. I provided over 100 emails back and forth. I mean, he goes on and on and on. They would have never recovered this money. They, I mean, it just goes on. Like it's, it, and they're absolutely it's like three, four pages. So when they get when we get that, finally the government set, comes back and they said three levels, or we're gonna go. We'll take him to court. We can go to court and let him present his evidence. So I call I, I call up. I'm talking to my, uh, Leanne, my lawyer, and she goes, "Okay, look, here's what they said. They said three levels. That's the most they'll give you is three levels off. That's it." And I said, "She said so. I'm gonna go ahead and put in the motion to have the evidentiary hearing." And I went, "No, no, 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 no." no. No, no, I, I, I'll take it. She says, what do you mean you'll take it? She says, you said, Frank said not to accept less than four levels. And I went, yeah, no, no, no. I said, no, you don't understand. I said, Frank told me to tell you that we wouldn't accept less than f four levels. I said, we were always going to be okay with accepting three levels. I only wanted three. I said, three's great. We'll take three. And she was like... I said, no, Frank just felt like if he needed you to fight for four and he knew we'd end up at three. That's why we originally asked for five to give him something. So they feel like they've got a win at three. But the truth is we always wanted three. She's like, um, okay, all right, well, I'll, fi I'll, I'll call him right now. She called him and I said, oh, and by the way, I don't want to go back to court. Like, I don't want to go back to court. I, we just have to agree on the language of the, of the, of the rule 35 motion. Like, I don't want to have to go to court, bro. They put you in a fucking van. I mean, they, they, they move you in a bus. They, they have to drive you all the way up to Atlanta. You're in shackles the whole time. You're trying to eat a sandwich with shackles on. You're sitting next to some guy who's killed 16 people and he's being moved to a pen. You know, it's, it's, it's horribly depressing and it's uncomfortable. It's, it's an eight hour drive in that bus. They have to stop here and stop here and stop here. And it's ridiculous. You know, so I, I, I was, Desperate not to be moved again. Then you could be up there for two months. You could be stuck in the hole, in a hole up there in Atlanta, in the um, Atlanta uh, prison. You could be stuck in what they call the the holdover for months, waiting to get go to court, get sentenced, and then go back. Like it's hell, bro. They got little mice. These you know everybody says, oh, they got rats. They not they're actually little mice. They're kind of cute, but you don't want them living in your cell with you. Like they're running around. It's fucking horrible. There's roaches. It's it's disgusting. And just boring as hell because you don't leave. You leave your cell like it, it's you leave. They let you out like I think it's three days a week for an hour. So you get out and it's like I can take a shower or I can use the phone because you only have an hour and you're standing in line for everything. So you're talking about they're letting out 150 guys and there's like six showers. How do you take a shower? Like you're even if half the guys are waiting to take a shower. That's 75 guys waiting to take a shower. So, I mean, this is a horrible situation. Anyway, 
I didn't want to do that. So she argued with them and they were like, yeah, we don't care if he goes back. We don't want to see this guy. So we go back and forth. It still took another three months going back and forth, back and forth, back and forth till we finally agreed on the language of the rule 35. So finally we send it to the judge. The judge signs off on it. And, and that ended up being three, what, three. What did I say? Three? No, no, I'm sorry. No, it was three levels off, but it was five years. So remember I was saying the first level was like 14. Then it was like 14. The next level was whatever. It was like 30 months off or something. The next level was like 50. Something. It was like five years off my sentence. I, I forget the exactly how it, but it ended up being like, like five years off my sentence. And I, I know I got some of the, the level, the math wrong on the months there, but it's, you know what I'm saying? It, it ended up being five five years off my sentence. So Frank had already reduced my sentence by seven years. And then he got me another five years off my sentence. The government fought the whole way. Now, the reason that the government didn't want to allow me to go to the appellate court is because had I won that motion, it would have been precedence, which means that other people, when they went to the computer, and they said, man, the government was supposed to reduce my sentence and they didn't do it. And they went on the, on the legal computer and looked it up and they looked up, you know, reduction sentence reductions. And basically, can you make the government give you a sentence reduction? My case would have come up and it would have said that an inmate had been promised a reduction. The government denied it. And he then filed a rule 35, I'm sorry, a, a 2255 and forced the government to reduce his sentence. Like the court agreed that he, that they, that the government had the right to, to compel the government to file a reduction. So far in the district, which I'm in, I think it's the, uh, I'm in the 11th district so far in like the 11th district, you cannot make them do it. So they don't want that to become precedent. Anyway, I end up getting my reduction five years off my sentence. Of course, I go to Frank. He's thrilled. You know, he's doing his little chuckle. He's got a little chuckle. He does. <laughs> I told you. <laughs> and then I, I remember he said, how much time do you have left? And I was like, bro, I'm going to be, I'll be in a halfway house in like a year. And he went, huh? Not enough time to get any more time. We don't have we don't have time to get anything else off. And I was just like, are you serious? Like, you know, he's like, yeah, there's just not enough time. And I was like, yeah, yeah, I'm good, Frank. Um, like this this guy. Anyway, so yeah, that's how Frank Amadeo got 12 years knocked off my sentence. You know, and you can say, oh, well, you cooperated and that's how you got the time off. No, no, no. I may have given him, you know, the, you know, the argue, I may have given him the, what to argue, like the conveyance or the, the, the vehicle to use, but you know, he, without him, I'd still be in prison right now. My sentence, my release date with good time was 2030. Without good time, my release date would have been 2035. Bro, like I'm, I, I'm, I'm supposed to be in prison right now. And had Frank, I not been lucky enough to be in the same prison as Frank Amadeo, I would be in prison right now. Like there's, there's not, I, I, you can't even, I can't even sit here and say, I would have figured something. No, you wouldn't have figured anything out. He was my last resort in that prison. He should have been my first choice. And he was my last resort. Now, listen, after the first reduction, he was the go-to person. Like for me, he was, you know, absolutely. Let's go see what Frank says. But, uh, that's, so that's my second reduction that Frank won for me. And I appreciate you guys uh, uh, checking out the video. If you like the video, do me a favor, hit the subscribe button, hit the bell to get notified of videos like this. Leave a comment in the comment section. And uh, yeah, I appreciate it. If you want to read the book, It's Insanity.
It's insanity. The bizarre story of a bipolar megalomaniac's insane plan for total world domination. That's a long subtitle, but what else am I going to say? Uh, the link to the book is in the description box. It's on Amazon and Audible. Great book. Way better than I can, way better story than I can tell it. I appreciate you guys watching. Thank you very much. See ya.